Our second lesson this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was famished. The tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple, saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down. For it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, again, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, away with you, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Last week in our sermon series on location, we considered Nazareth, the town where Jesus spent the majority of his life, where he was part of a family, where he had a home. If Jesus was Emmanuel, God with us as one of us, then certainly he also had experiences of confusion and loneliness. But it is probably safe to say that no experience of loneliness in Nazareth prepared Jesus for where he found himself not long after he left his hometown and was baptized in the River Jordan, the wilderness. Although we often think of the wilderness as a physical place that is wild and untouched, the truth is there are many kinds of wilderness, and we can find ourselves in the wilderness even though we might be in the middle of a city surrounded by people. The wilderness is the place where everything we thought we understood about ourselves and the world is thrown into question. The wilderness is also where we encounter God in a profound new way. Jesus didn't decide to go to the wilderness. Few of us ever do. He was compelled there, led by the Holy Spirit. This is often how it happens, sometimes because of a crisis, but sometimes for no discernible reason. We find ourselves in the wilderness where, like Jesus, we must wrestle with who we are, not just in our own eyes or in the eyes of the world, but who we are with God. When everything else about our lives falls away and we are alone with God, what is left? Cheryl Strayed has become famous as the author of the memoir, Wild, in which she tells her story of hiking 1,100 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail alone when she was just 26 years old. She was in the wilderness long before she hit the trail. In the years just before her unlikely adventure, Strayed's mother had lost a fierce and fast battle with cancer, and the grief had sent Strayed reeling into a life of drugs and casual sex that brought her six-year marriage to an end. She was living alone in a studio apartment and working as a waitress when she realized she needed to take drastic measures to change her life. Strayed was haunted by something her mother had told her shortly after her diagnosis. I've never been in the driver's seat of my own life. I've always been somebody's daughter or wife, or mother. Strayed had witnessed firsthand how her mother's identity was constructed around other people, first an abusive husband and then her three children whom she raised as a single mother. Strayed was determined not to allow herself to be defined solely by such roles. 
And part of what she hoped to find on the trail was a sense of radical aloneness. Maybe without anyone else around, she would gain a better sense of who she was. What felt profound about her time in the wilderness, she writes, was how few choices I had and how often I had to do the thing I least wanted to do. How there was no escape or denial, no numbing it down with a martini or covering it up with a roll in the hay. We have many ways of understanding our identity, but most explanations fall into two primary categories who we are and what we do. Who we are is a question we usually answer relationally. We understand who we are because of our relationships to others, spouses, parents, siblings, children, friends. We also define ourselves according to what we do, the gifts and skills we bring to the world. So when asked, we say, well, I'm a healthcare professional, I'm a lawyer, an administrator, a student. Immediately before the Holy Spirit compelled him into the wilderness, Jesus learns his true identity. At the River Jordan, after his baptism, a voice from heaven spoke, this is my son, the beloved. Regardless of how Jesus understood who he was and what he had come to earth to do, this was a pivotal moment, a crisis of sorts, because when that voice from heaven revealed Jesus' true identity, everything else about him, that he was the son of Mary and Joseph, that he was from Nazareth, that he was a carpenter, all of that fell away. In her book, Acedia and Me, Kathleen Norris talks about the ups and downs of her marriage. One of the lowest points came when her husband disappeared for two days, leaving behind what could only be interpreted as a suicide note. Fortunately, he was found alive and with a long regimen of therapy and medication, recovered, but it was a crisis point in Kathleen's life, a wilderness season. During this time, she discovered that the word crisis derives from a Greek word that means a sifting. She writes, even in my distress, I sense there might be a purpose to our present upheaval, to jostle, sift, and sort things until only what was most vital would remain. In the wilderness, as he sifted through his life and his labels, what remained for Jesus as everything else fell away was his foundational identity as God's beloved. And as soon as he got that figured out, well, that's when the devil showed up, tempting Jesus to take this identity as God's chosen ones, God's beloved, and to use it for his own sake, to create food out of rocks, to take advantage of his association with the powerful by letting angels rescue him from danger, to secure glory for himself by ruling the world. If you are the son of God, the devil begins going right after Jesus' identity. If you are the son of God. The devil is essentially saying, if God loves you so much, why should you ever be hungry? If God is so great and you are God's beloved, then why shouldn't you be able to do whatever you want without getting hurt? If God is truly God and you are God's chosen one, why shouldn't you be all powerful, revered by everyone? At some point, every one of us who have heard God's call must spend time in the wilderness. It is the place where we unlearn all of the lies our culture has fed us, lies which are about as satisfying as eating rocks. The lie that we can earn our worth through achievement, success at work or school, the perfect family, the biggest house, the fastest car, the most prestigious degree. The lie that we can keep ourselves safe and secure with the right alarm system, with a big enough retirement account or endowment, by building a wall to keep strangers out. 
the lie that we can hide away our shame and fear and anger, our messiness and mistakes, and present a polished self to the world, and that if we learn to do that well enough, none of those bad feelings can affect us. These are the rocks the devil offers us day to day and moment to moment, and they are lies. In Anna Quinlan's novel, Every Last One, the main character, Mary Beth, is the mother of three teenagers and the wife of a kind and stable doctor. She has good friends and runs a successful business. Yet at times, she finds herself crying for no discernible reason. I have no excuse for my tears, she says. If I were pressed, I would have to say they are the symptom of some great loneliness as free-floating and untethered to everyday life as a tornado is to the usual weather. It whirls through, ripping and tearing, and then I'm in the parking lot of the supermarket wiping my eyes, replacing my sunglasses, buying fish and greens for that night's dinner. If anyone asks how things are, I say what we all say. Fine, good, great, terrific, wonderful. The wilderness is the place where we do not have to say what we all say. In the wilderness, we can finally say, I am tired. I am sad. I am lonely. I am afraid. I'm angry. Of course, once we finally allow ourselves to say that, the devil is likely to show up tempting us with questions we cannot answer. If you are God's beloved, why would you ever feel tired or sad or lonely or afraid or angry? Come, sit with me and eat. And then the lies start all over again because we want them to be true. The devil will try to convince us that the food he serves, though it looks and tastes like rocks, will take all of our bad feelings away. But in the end, they are just rocks. They can never satisfy. In the wilderness, Jesus recognizes that what the devil offers is a lie. Even if Jesus manages to make those rocks look and taste like bread, they will still be rocks, utterly unsatisfying. The only thing that can satisfy in the wilderness is the one thing the devil cannot touch, who we are in the eyes of God, our true identity as God's beloved, an identity we cannot earn and which can never be taken away. Jesus leaves the wilderness secure in this identity, and we know this because we see it in everything he does and says after his wilderness time. Jesus leaves the wilderness and becomes a truth teller, speaking truth to the lies of his time and calling us to speak truth to the lies of our time. Again and again, Jesus will defy the dominant messages of his culture and religion, the ones that say who is in and who is out, who is clean and who is unclean, who is acceptable and who is irredeemable. Again and again, Jesus clears the table the devil has set with rocks and offers true nourishment to those who need it most, those consumed with shame or anger or fear, those who are sick and outcast, those who do not fit the mold of acceptability. This is the Savior we follow. And this is the work Jesus has called us as individuals and as a church to do. After President Kennedy was assassinated, a member of a church in Ann Arbor, Michigan, called their pastor to suggest the one thing the church might do to partially redeem the tragedy would be to provide Marina Oswald with an opportunity to improve her English. The widow of the accused assassin, Lee Harvey Oswald, was Russian by birth and had only been in the U.S. for a short time. Given what had happened, she was the recipient of all the anger and hatred over her husband's alleged deed. 
To make a long story short, with the cooperation of the FBI and others, Marina came to Ann Arbor. She moved in with a modest family who took seriously its devotion to God and who knew their true identity as God's beloved was the same as everyone else's, including Marina's. The church eventually issued a, a short press release about what they'd done, and the mail started pouring in. Some letters pointed out how unpatriotic this action was. Others called the church foolish and un-American. Others suggested it was profoundly unwise, a stain on our honored faith. The pastor and elders of the church answered every letter. And each response included the same line. The one thing you have not shown us, they wrote, is that what we have done is unlike Jesus Christ. As a community of those who seek to live from our foundational identity as God's beloved, we can be a place where people come to discover and claim or remember and reclaim their true identity as God's beloved. We can be a community that will not perpetuate the world's lies, that will not eat rocks with the devil, but rather that will invite people to sit with us at a table where we nourish one another with the truth about who we are, with acceptance in spite of whatever mistakes we have made, with compassion for the challenges we all face trying to live into the roles put upon us every day with love for every person who walks through our doors. That is food that nourishes and satisfies. May that be the only food we eat and the only food we serve. Amen.